The countdown to Election Day, battle for state House and Senate seats, who's putting more cash into a big campaign, and the governor's race a dead heat. What polls can you really believe? My week starts right now. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michigan-turnaround-plan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there, and welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. It has been an intense election season. Are you sick of those TV ads yet? Well, it all comes down to Tuesday. So coming up on My Week, a new poll in the governor's race says it is a dead heat. We'll look at the difference that absentee ballots can make in this race. Plus, what can you really believe about polls? We'll talk about it. Also, a last look at battles for seats in the state house and Senate and how Democrats are aiming for a shift in power there. Plus, the rationale behind dumping more cash into an already pricey Senate race. We'll also look at the Supreme Court race and what headlines you might see next week. Plus, a look at the end of Detroit's bankruptcy. It is all coming up, so let's get to our contributors. Nolan Finley, the editorial page editor of the Detroit News, and Stephen Henderson, the editorial page editor of the Detroit Free Press. So I want to start with the governor's race. Uh, two polls came out this week from both of your papers. So the mm -hmm. Detroit News had the governor up about six Mm -hmm. points and the free press now came out last night saying it's within two points yeah. a, a dead heat what has changed in this race and, and i'm going to start with you nolan well i mean our poll was uh taken we were in the field three four days earlier than the free press poll and what could be happening you could see this thing sort of people making up their minds as they will do in the last week and it's not going in the governor's direction i mean i I, I would be worried if I were his campaign because it looks like his support is falling and Shower's support is rising. And I think the internal polls from the campaign show pretty much the same thing. Talked to Steve Mitchell last night. His polling is showing that same trend. This race is really tightening up. And you, we could see a, a real razor-thin race on Tuesday. All right, so what are the things that are changing right now, Stephen? When you got those numbers back for the Free Press poll, were you surprised? Uh, actually, I wasn't because uh, the poll that we took last week uh, showed a pretty wide spread between the two candidates. And actually, we got some blowback from a lot of people who said uh, that the sampling was off, that, that, that was missing some Democratic voters um, uh, who, who've made up their mind uh, for, for, for the challenger. Um, so they went back and they reweighted the poll and and added in these absentee ballots uh, that the Democrats are going after in a really aggressive way. I mean, their campaign this year has really been focused on getting votes from people who don't show up in midterm elections, uh, and they've done it through these absentee ballots. When you reweight the poll with uh, you know an account for that effort, it gets a lot tighter. Uh, the, the Democrats may may end up with a lot more people voting than you would normally see in an off year. So Nolan, are Republicans targeting absentee votes as, as hard as the Democrats have made that a key part of their strategy well, this election? Well, I mean, it's a key part of their strategy. I don't think they're doing as well at that. Um, I mean, I think the Democrats have been at it a lot longer, and they have a lot more folks who didn't vote last time out, and that's who they're targeting here, something like 900,000 Democratic voters who didn't vote in 2010, so they have a bigger pool to work with. Um, yeah, Republic. I, I talked to a lot of folks last night after this poll came out, and you know they're pretty confident about their get out the vote efforts. But nobody pretends it's as good as the Democrats. I mean, Republican voters don't tend to climb on buses on election day and, and let themselves be bused to the polls. Uh, they're not as likely to be absentee voters, so they start with a disadvantage. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the polls and the validity of polls and why we're seeing such variations. Um, our friends at Bridge Magazine had an interesting piece this week about how you should interpret polls and how we should be looking at um, what polls come out, how you, how you trust certain polls in terms of who is conducting the poll, what kind of sample size, and, and what are some of the variables, I think, Nolan, should people be looking for um, when, they, when they read a poll? Well, I mean, obviously you want to um, 
look at a poll that's from a credible source. I mean, the newspapers have no reason to slant a poll. I mean, it's easily, as Steve talked about weighting earlier, it's easy to, to slant a poll one way or the other. You just overweight your sample to include more Democrats or, or more Republicans, which is d uh, polls that are aimed at fundraisers, funders, for example. If you're doing a poll to generate um, fundraising, they'll overweight to make it look closer so people get excited and write checks. But legitimate polls will pretty much reflect the weighting of the electorate and um, you know, all but, of the different and, graphic But that's groups. the trick, right? Mm -hmm. uh, figuring out who the electorate is mm -hmm. going to be on election day right. is, is everything in your poll. And that's why you see uh, such a, a range, I think, uh, when you look at different polls, is that different, uh, different pollsters are guessing uh, that that more people, more Democrats will come out, or more Republicans will come out, or more older people will come out, or more young new voters will come out. I mean, you're you're, you're really trying to to figure that out. The other thing that's that's happening is, you know, technology is changing yeah. pollster, polling uh, dramatically uh, right now. Uh, there are some pollsters I've heard who are no longer even using phones because Something. they can reach people on online. Um, uh, to get their to get their answers, and so uh, you think of the number of people who use social media more than they use their phone, uh, or, right, or people don't, don't even have a landline, or don't, or, or don't answer or their landline anymore, or don't answer their cell phone uh, because when they when it's an and, and also you're also looking at the way the questions are asked, and if they're asked by a person or if there are these robocalls as well. Auto, if they're an automated, I mean, a lot of there are a lot of variables, but of the legitimate pollsters in this town, the ones who are polling for the newspapers and television stations. They tracked fairly consistently together. A few weeks ago, when everybody was in that five to eight percent range for Snyder, mm -hmm. the New York Times did a, a poll, and it was like the race was dead heat. And you know, our pollster looked at it and he said, "Well, they've got a plus ten Democratic vote. Normal Democratic vote would be probably plus four, plus five. And if you start getting more than that, you're going to skew the poll." Well, and I think that that again, this this absentee push, uh, which is is unprecedented in, in, in my experience. I mean, I've <coughs> sat down with uh, uh, some of the leadership in the Democratic Party to see what it is that they're doing. It, it, is, a, it is a game changer in terms of the way you prosecute a, a midterm election it campaign. could be. I mean, if like, it works, our right? poster looked at, at this and said he didn't see a huge surge in new voters because of the absent, absentee, well, and that's the rub, absentee right? drive. And, you know, as we talked earlier, just because a, the, uh, a Dem the Democrats or Republicans send a, a absentee ballot to a well, who they suspect is a Democrat or, Repub or Republican voter and it gets returned, that doesn't mean they Yeah, it doesn't mean they're necessarily voted along those party lines. All right, in, in the couple of minutes we have left talking about the governor's race, uh, we have the president coming in this weekend campaigning on behalf of Mark Schauer and all the other Democrats on the ticket. And then you have Governor Chris Christie coming here on Monday um, uh, for Governor Snyder. Again, are these just these efforts to rally the base, Stephen? Well, it, it is. It, on the Democratic side, uh, they think they've done what they needed to do with this absentee thing. They're, the numbers are going to be where they want them. Now they've got to deliver on Election Day, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, you still have far more people who show up uh, at the polls mm -hmm. to cast their ballots, and you've got to get people excited to do that. And so you bring in somebody like uh, a President Obama who may be unpopular with independents and, and Republicans, but is still an enormously uh, beloved within the base, you're trying to get those people motivated to get out uh, and vote. But Obama is not as unpopular here as he is in a lot of other states, that's and that's another one, of, another thing that is sort of hurting Snyder. There's not that huge anti-Barack Obama vote this time, and he certainly didn't exploit it in his campaigning. But this is a base election. We've seen wave elections uh, since 2006. Every election's been a wave election. This is a more normal election, and I'm not sure we know how to read it. All right, so in, intense campaigning we're going to see in the next uh, in the next five days then. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you will not be able to watch television over <laughs> the weekend without uh, seeing all of these commercials, uh, you know, in, in, in every break. But you can expect, I think, a, a strategy shift now that they've seen these polling and, and read these polling. I mean, the, our pollster, and I, I, I assume yours, showed real strong support in southeastern Michigan for the governor's handling of the bankruptcy. He's got to tout that in these last few days. And Shower sort of kind of peaked out on the grievance vote. He has to stand up there with a commercial that says, I'm going to do this, 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 and this, because that's what's missing. I think that's why he hasn't pushed um, over the top. Well, yet. and you look at, you look at not, that, not that newspaper endorsements mean 
everything, but but I think uh, they, they are one gauge of, of where things go. Mark Schauer did not get an endorsement from any major newspaper in the state. Uh, which, was which was surprising. Uh, it, a lot of people were talking about the fact that the free press did not endorse Mark Schauer. Yeah, well, I mean, we're not a rubber stamp for the Democratic Party. I mean, we, we tend to align uh, on social issues, especially more closely with, with Democrats, but they got to come in and make their burden just like the Republicans did. Mark Schauer was unable to do that. He doesn't appear as ready to govern as I'd like him to be uh, at, at this point. Rick Snyder uh, is, is a slightly better choice for that. All right, uh, tight race. So turning now to the battle for House and Senate seats here in Michigan. Republicans hold majority in both, but Democrats, well, they're hoping to dent the supermajority in the Senate. So Nolan, let me ask you this before we talk about the House. Let's talk about the Senate. How will that help them in denting, uh, in stopping that supermajority in the Senate? Explain that for people. Well, I mean, Republicans still think, and, and I think uh, most people who are observing this think that Republican, are, are we talking state Senate? We're talking or? about state Senate. Well, I don't think they're going to make that, um, that pick up that many state seats in the state Senate to make a difference. Where the fight is, is in the House. And if this governor's race is as close as it looks, that could wash out uh, a good number of uh, Republican House members. And we could have a, either a Democratic House or a very, very slim majority uh, um, uh, for the Republicans in the House, which will make it much harder for the governor to get his agenda through. If he loses one or two Republicans on any issue, you know, you'll have a stalemate. Um, the Senate, the margin is so wide. I, I just don't think... Um, the, the Democrats should pick up, you know, and it all, it all has to work together, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if Mark Schauer gets these votes uh, that they think he's going to get in order to win the election this, from this surge of absentees, that should play out down the ballot. So uh, you get closer to the idea of a Democratic House. I'm not sure you quite get there. Uh, and you pick up some seats in the Senate, even though, uh, you know, it would be impossible to, to, to create a Democratic Senate majority at this point. But there's fewer Democratic ticket splitters, I would assume, this time because of the Senate race. A lot of Republicans will vote for the the governor, or a lot of people will vote for, the, for Snyder, who won't vote for Terry Lynn Land. So you're not going to have people going in there and just yanking just the elephant's tail, yeah. you know, like you will on the Democratic side. So you have people looking a little bit down the ticket. What would that do if we did get a Democratic majority? In, in the House, and what would that do to shape Lansing in the next four it years? Would, uh, the, the biggest thing it would do is it would give, if, if Mark Schauer is, is the next governor, uh, it would give him an ally. I mean, it would give him a tool to, to start working with. Uh, I am very fearful, in fact, of the idea that, that you'd have a Democratic governor and an entirely Republican legislature. I think that results in a stalemate uh, that would get us nowhere. And I, I think Republicans are as responsible for that uh, as, as, as the Democrats would be. I mean, uh, getting them to work together, I think, would be an enormous, enormous feat. Um, uh, you know, if Rick Snyder is the governor and you get a Democratic House, that also gives him an ally. Uh, you know, the, the governor, I think, has been frustrated with the far right wing of his party and felt pushed to do things and consider things that he didn't want to do. If he had a Democratic House, it would give him, again, a lever to pull and, and, uh, and use to try to, to tone down some of this, this nonsense yeah. on, the, on the far right. I would agree that he'd do better in a um, divided legislature, uh, but I think you can just look to Washington and see what this that what this might look like or just roll back the clock five six years to Michigan and see what this is going to look like we didn't get anything done here for an awfully long time uh, <laughs> under the last administration and you know the problem is uh, the problem is on the right uh, that that is a party that is 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 lurching further rightward uh, and where the, the the word compromise has been turned into blasphemy uh, uh, you know if we get a Democratic well, governor, we're going to need them to stop uh, that kind I, of, of politicking I, I, and start governing. You look at the Democrats in this last legislature, they voted no on almost everything. The problem's not just on the right. The problem is each on party bunkers wins. down. Every, everybody bunkers down. And you had folks voting no on things they, they probably support. But do you think that there the will end up being some kind of payback, though, if you the do the Democrats? All the governor's big wins, Medicaid expansion, uh, the grand bargain in Detroit, mm -hmm. 
uh, uh, all of the big picture things he did, he did with Democrats. Uh, the Democrats came along and he got enough Republican votes. I think that's a model for the kind of governance we need. Uh, but but you do need more Democrats, I think, in order to make it work in the next in the next. I, I, I think it'll be interesting when, if once we see the makeup after after November fourth, would we then see a difference in what the lame duck session would end up being? Should you get a shift in power? In the you House? know, I think you will. I think you're going to see them try to finish their agenda then in lame duck. Not sure how effective it'll be. Uh, I don't think the governor, just knowing his character, is going to sign off on state changing legislation as he walks out the door. That doesn't strike me as who he is. I think one fallout we haven't talked about is what it means for the city of Detroit. The governor has started this and has brought the legislature around with him. I think if there's a substantial change in Lansing, Detroit may be left out sort of at a time he it needs Lansing the most. All right, we'll be watching those races as well. All right, talk about investment. Senate candidate Terry Lynn Land put in another $650,000 of her own money into her campaign this week. That brings the grand total that she's personally invested to $3.5 million. Now, multiple polls show this race is not close. Republicans have pulled some funding. Why would she invest in this? Are there internal numbers that show that more money could make a difference? Uh, I, I have to admit, I was a little baffled when I saw that this week. It's Stephen. a little it's a little puzzling. I, it may be that that she feels you know, she's this is someone who's lost almost all the rest of her support as you as you point out. I mean, the national have have pulled out. She would not be on the air, I don't think, uh, this weekend without her own money. Uh, and so maybe it's it's to at least, you know, play through and and finish the the, the campaign. I'm I'm not sure. I don't know enough about what's going on inside that campaign. I don't think anybody knows what's going mm -hmm. on inside that campaign. Uh, I, I can't explain that kind of spend in, in the last days. In the last the polls week. Show she, that. You want to take a crack at that, Nolan? She pledged to spend $5 million when she got into this race. That's what she told the Republican That's Party nice. she would spend <laughs> out, of her, out of her own pocket. Um, so she's not reached that limit yet. I think um, when she was looking at the governor at 6 and 8 up, she felt there might be a little boost in her own spending. There might be some pull-in effect. I wouldn't be surprised to see some outside money come in to keep that race from going so far that it washes out folks down, down the ticket. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Uh, so the Detroit News came out with their endorsement mm -hmm. for Senate, and you, uh, the paper, endorsed Gary Peters. Mm -hmm. What kind of response are you getting? Well, probably like Steve's getting. I mean, it was a break from our tradition in terms of political philosophy. We just didn't think she made the case on the campaign trail. Uh, we didn't think she was ready, that she had um, done the preparation work she needed, or that she had presented herself as a competent, confident candidate uh, that could, who could go to Washington and be influential for Michigan. We just. You know, it was a bad campaign, and if you look at campaigns as a job interview, she failed it. Has this campaign been a surprise to you, Stephen, in terms of how it's gone and, and, and how it's kind of ended up? The, the land mm -hmm. campaign? I, you know, I, I, I said from the beginning when, when she got into the race that I was concerned that she was not going to be up to, to, to challenging someone like Gary Peters, who I think is far more tested uh, at this level and 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 has had you know three three house terms to get ready for this Senate run I, you know the, the Republicans would have been better off if someone like Mike Rogers uh, or Dave Camp both of whom have decided to leave government instead of run for higher office uh, I think either one of those candidates would be really really competitive uh, with Gary Peters Tara Lynn Land was not ever I think gonna gonna be able to, but, to to close this deal you know it says something I think about politics in general, both parties in this state, that you had nobody, you had an open Senate seat. Uh, and, and remember, when you had an open governor's seat, you had seven Republicans, eight Republicans jump in yeah. on it, and, you know, two or three Democrats. And this time, we had one from each party willing to step up and run. And I think that's hurt the process. I, I think a good, vigorous pro uh, primary would have helped both of these candidates and would have given Michigan voters a broader choice. Why? Because it's not a desirable job or because politics, as usual, kind of stinks well, when I it mean, comes to Washington, D.C.? If you look at it, I mean, when, when Rogers and Camp were making their decisions, uh, it didn't look like um, nobody at that point was really believing Republicans take, could take the majority. So you'd be going into the Senate as a minority party member. It's the most dysfunctional body in America. Under Harry Reid, he hasn't allowed a vote on a single issue 
this year. He hasn't allowed amendments on um, to, to come to bills. Even Democrats can't get their things to the floor. And people look at them and say, why do I want to spend all my time raising money, which is what you have to do, to sit in here and do nothing? All right. Well, um, some quick thoughts I want to turn to on the Supreme Court race and how crucial you think ads are for the candidates running for the two full term and one partial term seat. Because for people who aren't really experienced with these judges, I mean, the ads are the only way that they can really get to know the candidates if they don't do, I think, a lot of research, Stephen. Yeah, well, and this is this is the big picture problem with the way we handle the Supreme Court here. This idea that these should be uh, uh, nonpartisan judges elected and nominated as part of a partisan process and then forced to run it's it's confusing it's confusing to voters and i think the 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 messaging you see from these judges is confusing i think a lot of them would say i don't want to have to do this i don't want to have to be out there saying these things but what choice do i have if i've got to get votes to keep my job or to, or to get it um, uh, i i think the advertising in that in that race has been bizarre at, at times and and really inaccurate at, at other times. We got a uh, jingle now from yeah. Bernstein's camp. Yeah. Well, Wait, there's a jingle? Bernstein and Bernstein. It's, it's our, I, I love hearing you sing, especially when you're singing political singer. ads, you know. But you know, we always, you know, a lot of people criticize the process that elected judges and partisan ballots are the wrong way to go. And yet this is produced in Michigan, a very good Supreme Court, an excellent Supreme Court. At times and, it's been good, at times it's been awful. At the current Supreme Court is a first very Supreme good court, court is better than we've and had in a it's, long time. It's each election it has improved, and the Court of Appeals is not not a bad bad court. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of questions about the process, but the results it's it's produced is not bad. It's not bad. So the fact that you are singing a jingle does that mean then the ads have been effective? Absolutely not. I, I well, mean, his ads are super effective. He's going to win. He's probably going to win. Well, those that was from ten years of <laughs> Call Sam ads before this. For goodness sakes. <laughs> so ads effective before Lee's Well, I mean, I think, I think uh, some that. of them are, some of them are. I mean, I think you're going to see the two incumbents probably uh, uh, keep their seats. And then Bernstein, because yeah. he's so far ahead in every poll that we've mm -hmm. seen, he probably is a shoe in. There you go, name recognition. All right, <laughs> as we leave election talk, and I love having the two newspaper men here because I'm going to ask you to come up. What do you think the headlines are going to be next week after this election? And I'm going to ask you to look a little bit into your uh, magic morning, eight ball or your crystal morning. ball. You on, on Wednesday morning. morning. I look at Steve's head. <laughs> <laughs> look, he's talking. <laughs> um, I think we'll, we might be up Wednesday morning. I think yeah. uh, we may not all have even gone to bed because uh, if the governor's race is as tight as it, as it looks, we may have to, to wait really long time. Listen, to know so this is like a, kind of like a 1990 all over and again? I ran the election in 1990 for the news and I was there at, in the morning with the last edition about the roll and there still were they just a know. few hundred right. votes and we finally, um, they, the Associated Press called and said, what are you guys going to call it? And I said, well, I don't know. Um, who hasn't, what votes aren't counted yet? And he said, well, um, Livonia, Plymouth, Canton. I said, well, those are Republican districts. It, I would say that Englers won. I mean, it was far from calling it. It was just an observation. Right. They sent out a bullet and Detroit News calls it. <laughs> Detroit News. And, we, and we said, well, That was you? We said, that was you, Nolan. We, we so may as awesome. well go with it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we rolled the dice. And we, and we were, but that was an election that this one could very much mimic. We yeah. might not know. And we haven't had an election here uh, that's been that close since 90. Not in the state. Right. I mean, of not course, the, the 2000 presidential. 2000 well, presidential, sure. For everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Any other sub headlinings like um, Democratic strategy change, is a game changer? Well, or any uh, anything else that you think we might see? I think if they pull this off, uh, if Mark Schauer is able to to win uh, largely on the back of this absentee strategy, that becomes that becomes a national story. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, it changes it changes strategy in almost every state uh, with a Democratic advantage, but. Uh, where Democrats don't show up in that mid mat, that midterm year, uh, you know, Lon Johnson, who's the, the the new party chair, becomes becomes a rock star, yeah. uh, and and I, you know, you could see him going all over the place uh, okay. uh, trying to do that. And if an incumbent governor governor loses in a state that is improving economically, uh, where people where he has a, a fairly good job performance rating, and more than half the people think the state's headed in the right direction. That's a remarkable thing. I've never seen that before. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think uh, this governor was weak from the beginning in terms of uh, being an incumbent. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Democrats, uh, 
it looked like they were going to look like they were going to blow that. Uh, and if if this absentee strategy works, they didn't, and so uh, that becomes a big story. All right, and so we'll be uh, we'll be watching. We'll be talking all, all about it. One thing I do want to mention we didn't get a chance to talk about tonight. We are going to hear that ruling from um, Judge Rose in the bankruptcy next Friday. So that'll be another headline for, to keep you are guys. Are we doing busy. an election show? Well, you know, it's funny that you should mention that, <laughs> Nolan. It's funny you should mention we that because <laughs> we want to tell you. Don't forget. Join us Monday night at 7 o'clock for our live election special. It's all of the last-minute analysis that you need before you go to the polls on Tuesday. So, of course, join, join Nolan, Stephen, and myself Monday night. And it's going to be live, so get on social media. Mm -hmm. Get Twitter. Should we trust you on live television? You know, That's, you, you never know what you get. You never know. You can always find us at myweek.org. I'm Christy McDonald. We will see you next week for My Week, and make sure you join us for Monday night. Take care. Recently, Michigan's economy has begun to turn around. Michigan's gained over 250,000 new jobs. We've paid off $20 billion in long-term debt. And our population is increasing for the first time in a decade. But to make Michigan a top 10 state, there's still plenty of work to be done. Step up and help put Michigan on top. Learn what you can do at michigan-turnaround-plan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta.